Hi, welcome to our channel of IGNU Audiobooks, Indira Gandhi National Open University, School of Social Sciences, SOS, Master's Degree Programs, MA in Psychology, MAP, Second Year, MPC 0-3 Interventions in Counseling, Block 4 Counseling, Future Directions, E-Counseling, Unit 4 Research Findings, 4.0 Introduction, According to John MacLeod, 2003 research is a systematic process of critical inquiry, leading to valid propositions and conclusions that are communicated to interested. Others, in counseling research very few researches are empirical or based on scientific facts. Actually counseling is an art to deal with the individuals on one hand. On other, hand it is a science also as counselor applies techniques in a controlled way and he is much trained to control and modulate a person's emotion, thought and behavior, although tools are not like parameters of medical science, but they are standardized and findings are inferred according to the norms. The criteria of emotional and mental problems are universally established, valid and reliable. This field looks very much subjective, but the approach, the way by which the counselor deals with the client is, every minute exploratory and challenging. It is hard to make the person change his own thoughts, behavior or personality or way of dealing with interpersonal relationships. A professional counselor needs lots of training to deal effectively with the problems of the client. Dot four dot one objectives. After reading this unit you will be able to describe the association of basic researches done earlier with the recent Researchers in the field of counseling discuss counseling researches as basically based on single case based follow up researches, explain the pre and post evaluation experiment researches, outcome researches have also been done in this area. Define e counseling is the leading area of research and elucidate the ethical issues related to the counseling researches to be taken care in future. Four point to the leading counseling research. Approach, in some way or other there is found connections between recent researches and the earlier researches, the recent researches based on the experience of the client, e.g. Rani, 1990, have similar approach to client-centered research carried out in the 1940s, example, Lipkin 1948. Similarly, current research into nonspecific or general characteristics, Grenkovage and Knock Rose, 1990 can be traced back to Fiedler, 1950, and Watson, 1940. The explosion of studies of outcome and effectiveness that occurred in the 1960s and 1970s had its precursor in the 1940s, I think 1952. Contemporary, attention to the problems of intensive case study methodology, Hilliard, 1993, Jones, 1993, represents a fascinating recapitulation of the dilemmas and challenges. Confronted by Henry Murray and his colleagues in the 1920s and 1930s, Murray, 1938, dot, the concept of non-defectiveness that informed much of the early client-centered, research has become replaced by ideas such as therapist reflection in more recent studies. Research into the Rogerian necessary and sufficient conditions of empathy Acceptance and congruence has for the most part been recast as the study of the Therapeutic Alliance. Marlon, 1973, surveys the history of psychodynamic research. Lightyear, 1990, examines the history of C1 in centered research. Treacher, 1983, looks at the field from a politically informed radical perspective. Hill and Corbett, 1993, approach. The evolution of therapy, the core assumptions and techniques characteristic of psychoanalysis were described by Freud in cases such as Dora, Freud, 19011979, The Rat Man, Freud, 1909-1979, and Schreber, Freud, 19101970. The founder of behaviorism, J.B. Watson, illustrated the applicability of behavioral concepts to problems of emotional disturbance through his famous study of Little Albert. Carl Rogers, 1942-1951, 
included several cases in counseling and psychotherapy and client-centered therapy, the key books that define the nature of the client-centered approach to counseling. The tradition of using case studies as a teaching tool is also apparent in the collections of cases brought together by Wedding and Cosini, 1979, Kutash and Wolf, 1986, and Dryden, 1987, and in the widespread use of film sessions, such as the famous Gloria Tapes, 4.3 Systematic Case Study Research, a key stage in the acceptance of case study methods was the publication in 1980 of a series of case studies by Hans Strupp, 1980. Then a detailed analysis of a single case carried out by Hill, Carter and O'Farrell, 1983A, was done. This was the first case study to be published in the Journal of Counseling Psychology, together with commentary pieces, Hill et al., 1983 B. Howard, 1983, Lambert, 1983. The appearance of the Hilletal, 1983 A, paper in a journal that had previously specialized in large scale, extensive rather than intensive studies represented a breakthrough. In legitimacy for this approach, the special section of the Journal of Consulting and clinical psychology devoted to single-case research in psychotherapy, Jones, 1993. More recently, the development of the assimilation model of client change has largely relied on testing and elaboration of the model in the context of a series of case studies, e.g. Honosweb et AI, 1998-1999. Systematic case study research represents the best way of constructing a knowledge base that is relevant to practice. The issues involved in developing an appropriate methodology for single-case research in counseling and psychotherapy have been explored by Edwards, 1998, Elliott, 2001, 2002, and Schneider, 1999. 4.3.1 Qualitative Single-Case Study Research in Counseling a qualitative research in this area is based on the experiences of the clients and these are descriptive by nature. Some of the procedures used for gathering this kind of material include recording therapy sessions, stimulated recall of sessions, interviews, diaries or journals, open-ended questionnaires, projective techniques, and observation of meetings. A set of narrative case studies that has been widely read is the Love's Executioner Collection by Evine Vallon, 1989. These case studies are characteristic of the case report written by a counselor or therapist based on work with one of his or her own clients. Bolger, 1965, reviews the history and use of this type of clinical case study in therapy research. There is some research evidence too support the idea that counsellors and clients can sometimes diverge greatly in their interpretation of events, Kashak, 1978, Min Settle, Dot, Mons and Thorn, 1988, Dryden and Yankura, 1992, and Yalo and Elkin, 1974, have each produced case studies that are collaborations between counsellor and client. Dryden and Yankura, 1992, and Mons and Thorne, 1988, both taped counseling sessions and reviewed these tapes with the clients some months after the end of counseling. The participants in Yalo and Elkin, 1974, kept diaries and used these to stimulate their memories of the therapy process. However, no systematic methods of qualitative analysis to interpret or check the data have been applied in these researches. A more systematic narrative case study is the investigation by Eth Harrington, 2000, into the experiences of two male clients who had been sexually abused. This case report draws on a range of analytic strategies drawn from contemporary qualitative research. Other examples of narrative case studies can be found in MacLeod and Lynch, 2000, and MacLeod and Balamoutsu, 2000, 2001. Dot, one of the central methodological issues in narrative case study research arises from the realization that it is always possible to generate alternative interpretations of a life or case. 
the debate over the case of Schreber, Freud, 1910-1979, presents a dramatic example of the radically different interpretations of a case, Schreber, an eminent German judge developed paranoid schizophrenia in later life. Freud used the evidence of this case in the construction of his theory of the origins of paranoia in repressed homosexuality, Schatzman, 1973, drawing on historical work by Nydeland, 1959, presented an alternative interpretation of the case, viewing the apparent delusions of Schreber as frustrated attempts to communicate about the extreme abuse he had received in early childhood. Another example can be found in the analysis by Runyon, 1981, of Why Did Van Gogh Cut Off His Ear? In a review of biographical writing on Van Gogh, Runyon, 1981, found 13 competing, but plausible, psychological explanations for this event in the life of the artist. Bromley, 1981-1986, suggests that researchers carrying out case studies should apply a quasi-judicial approach, for example seeking out alternative views on the data or appointing an adversary to the research team. Murray, 1938, used a diagnostic council, MacLeod, 1992, of five or six researchers who met to consider different perspectives on a case. Devele and Hari, 1976, have described a model for research in which two research teams study each case in parallel, coming together, at regular intervals to compare findings. Bromley, 1986, takes the view that the field of case study research must create a set of rules and case law that can be applied in deciding the validity of competing explanations of a case. Murray and Morgan, 1945, and Devele and Hari, 1976, propose that competing interpretations can be used in generating hypotheses that guide a further cycle of inquiry and data gathering. Mons and MacLeod, 1984, argue that in some instances, alternative interpretations represent different realities that cannot be reconciled, and that these different viewpoints should all be respected in a research report within social psychology and psychoanalysis. There have been psychobiographical or psychohistorical studies of famous people such as Luther, Gandhi, Lincoln, Shakespeare, and many others. The book by Runyon, 1981b, represents an excellent review of this field of study. The Narrative Study of Lives series, edited by Lieblich and Josselson, 1997, and McAdams, Josselson and Lieblich, 2001, provide excellent examples of the type of narrative case study research which has the potential to be highly relevant in the domain of counseling and psychotherapy. 4.3.2 Single Case Experiments The method known as the N equals L or single subject study represents an application of the case study approach to evaluating therapeutic change in individual cases. Hilliard, 1993, uses the term single case experiment to describe this type of research since it employs the classic experimental principle of testing a hypothesis. This type of case study is usually based on the administration of a standard test or behavioral assessment on a number of occasions, before, during and after the treatment. The pre-treatment assessments constitute a baseline measure of the target behavior which it is wished to change. The ongoing assessments carried out during treatment display the actual effect of the intervention, while the post-therapy or follow-up assessments give a measure of the stability or permanence of change. This kind of research design is known as time series analysis and its simplest form is the A-B time series, where A is the pre-treatment baseline and B is the treatment period. An example of an A-B time series case study is the report by Weens and Harachek, 1992, on their work with a client with a severe eating disorder. The client was a woman of 35 who presented with a problem of vomiting after eating most types of food. In the past she had been severely obese and had undergone two surgical operations to remove part of her stomach and abdominal fatty tissue. After these in this form of N equals 1 case study, 
The impact of an intervention is traced through its application to a series of problems reported by one client. 4.3.3 Single Case Quantitative Studies in Single Case Quantitative Analysis, Hilliard, 1993. The aim is to use quantitative techniques to trace the infolding over time of variables, but without, as in n equals 1 single case experiments, introducing any experimental manipulation or control of these variables. An example of this type of research is the Hill et al. 1983 study of process and outcome in a client who received 12 sessions of time limited and site oriented psychological counseling. The outcome was assessed by a set of standard measures. The client and a significant other, her mother, both wrote summaries of their perceptions of the value of the counseling. Process measures included ratings of counselor and client verbal response modes. Anxiety as expressed in client and counselor speech patterns, activity levels, number of speech acts, of both participants, counselor intentions, and counselor and client perceptions of session effectiveness and significant events. Best versus worst sessions were compared. 4.3.4 Combined Quantitative and Qualitative Case Studies The final approach to case study method identified by Hilliard, 1993 refers to studies combining quantitative and qualitative techniques of data gathering and analysis within one study. The originator of this approach to case study methodology was Henry Murray, whose 1938 book Explorations in Personality remains a landmark in the field of personality research. Murray, 1938, developed a process by which the key researchers working on a case would meet as a diagnostic counsel, McLeod, 1992, to arrive at an agreed formulation of a case. The general approach to case study methodology pioneered by Murray is also reflected in the work of Duell and Harry, 1976, and Bromley, 1981, 1986. It is often difficult to gather together a team of researchers all interested in collaborating on the same case. There can also be difficulties in finding research subjects or participants who are willing to spend many hours providing information about themselves. Qualitative, hermeneutic single case efficacy studies The approaches to case study research have been integrated into a coherent qualitative, hermeneutic single case methodology by Bohat, 2000, Elliot, 2001, 2002, and Patika et al., 2002. The primary aim of this type of case study is to investigate the effectiveness of therapy through analysis of a series of case studies. Bohat, 2000, and Elliot, 2001, 2002, recommend the use of a research team. Once the data set is gathered together, members of the team analyze it in the light of a set of plausibility criteria. These criteria operate as a kind of case law by giving explicit rules for arriving at an agreed interpretation of evidence. One group of researchers seeks to assemble all the information that it can in support of the case that therapy has been effective and other speaks against it. The two teams then go through the arguments until a consensus can be reached. This methodology is similar both to the approach developed by Henry Murray in the 1930s and to the method of consensual qualitative research used by Clara Hill and her associates, Hill et al., 1997. Several strategies can be employed to address the issue of generalizability in case studies, Kazdin, 1981, Wynn, 1994. No single experiment or survey provides conclusive evidence taken alone. It is only when a number of studies produce similar results. The concept of replication implies that each case must be seen as equivalent to a separate experiment or survey. The logic of sampling research findings is virtually impossible to achieve in case study research because of the time and resources required to obtain case data of sufficient quality. The logic of replication, on the other hand, is central to systematic case study research. Ideally, the conceptual model generated in the first case study is tested in the second and subsequent studies. The series of case studies carried out by Strupp, 1980, illustrate the use of the theoretically important concepts of success and failure to guide the selection of cases for replication. Yin, 1994, 
gives other examples of this approach. The most ambitious attempt to carry out theoretical replication is the study by Murray, 1938, in which a series of 50 cases was used in the development of an influential theory of personality. Logically, a single instance or event can be enough to refute a general theory. For example, a theory such as all crows are black will be refuted by a sighting of only one white crow. A further critical issue in case study research arises from the communicability of case material. Often, researchers gather more case material than they know how to handle and produce reports that are lengthy and impenetrable. Case study research produces detailed accounts of individual cases that can be useful for practitioners. It is also a mode of research that enables practitioners to make a contribution to the research literature. It would seem reasonable to suggest that counseling and psychotherapy research is about to see a period of innovation and discovery in relation to the utilization of systematic case study methods, 4.4 outcome studies, 4.4.1 types of outcome studies, 1. Client satisfaction studies, a client satisfaction study evaluates the benefits of counseling by asking clients to complete a short, simple questionnaire once they have finished seeing their counselor. The influential paper by Seligman, 1995, illustrates an interesting application of satisfaction research methods in the form of a client survey carried out by a consumer organization in the USA. More detailed accounts can be found in Atkinson and Greenfield. 1994, Berger, 1983, Lebo, 1982, and Webb, 1993. 2. Randomized controlled trials. A randomized trial involves first of all finding a pool of people who are all seeking help and who have a similar problem, example, as diagnosed through a psychiatric interview or through their scores on a questionnaire. These clients are then randomly assigned to different treatment conditions, as in the Sloan et al. 1975 study. These conditions may comprise two or three different kinds of therapy, or a therapy compared with a control condition, e.g. remaining on a waiting list for six months, or a comparison with a placebo condition, e.g. being given regular meetings with a helper who does not use actual therapeutic skills or interventions. The client's level of anxiety, depression, Phobias or other problems are assessed before therapy, at the end of therapy and then again at a follow-up period. Randomized control trials are widely used in medicine, for example in trials of the effectiveness of new drug treatments. 3. Naturalistic outcome studies. This kind of study is similar to a client satisfaction study insofar as it involves collecting data on every client who is seen in a clinic or counseling agency. In it before and after measures of change are taken, rather than relying on a one-shot questionnaire completed only at the end of counseling. Naturalistic outcomes are basically built around routine administration of questionnaires or other data collection methods, e.g. target, complaint forms, by the staff of counseling agencies. Naturalistic studies cost a lot less to set up and provide a picture of therapy as it is practiced in real-life conditions rather than in the somewhat artificial conditions of a trial. 4. Qualitative outcome studies Another way of evaluating outcome is to carry out qualitative, open-ended interviews with clients. Perhaps it has not been used any great extent in counseling research, probably due to the domination of quantitative statistical methods in the outcomes literature. The use of qualitative methods in outcome research is explored in MacLeod, 2000, 4.4.2 use of tools, a completely different approach to demonstrating change in outcome studies involves using well-validated standardized scales and arguing that the therapy being evaluated can be shown to be effective if the test scores recorded by clients move from the symptomatic range before therapy into the normal asymptomatic range following treatment. An example of this type of study is the Burkham and Shapiro 1990 investigation of the outcome of very brief 
Physician, Therapy with Moderately Depressed White Collar Workers In this study, the criterion for success was that, over the course of treatment, a client would improve at least one standard deviation below the mean of scores obtained in pre-therapy administration of the test, in this case the Beck Depression Inventory or BDL. Being able to show that clients move from distress to normal is a powerful demonstration of the effectiveness of a form of counseling or psychotherapy tests such as the CO, the Outcome Questionnaire, OQ, Beck Depression, Inventory, BDI, Hopkins Symptom Checklist, SCL 90, and Minnesota Multiphasic, Personality Inventory, MMPI, have been widely employed in outcome studies to provide an assessment of personality functioning and adjustment before and after. Therapy and at follow-up, an alternative approach, developed by Chene and Kin, 2001-2001b, has been to train the counsellor to administer a specially designed quality of life tool within actual counselling sessions, 4.4.3 control groups. The control group formats has its distinctive advantages and disadvantages. The Massio, et al., 1979, for example, wish to study the effects of psychotherapy with acutely depressed clients but were concerned about the ethical implications of denying help to research participants allocated to a control condition. They described it as non-scheduled treatment control, in which control group clients were told that many people spontaneously recovered from depression that they could enter therapy whenever they wished and that they would be regularly reassessed by an independent clinical evaluator to see if they needed immediate treatment. Under these very carefully planned conditions, only 33% of the control clients remained in the control group at the end of the planned 16-week waiting period. It was highly respectful and caring in terms of responding ethically to the needs of clients, although not much scientific. 4.5 e-counseling researches, Barakatel, 2008, concluded that online therapy was particularly effective for treating anxiety and stress with lasting effects and on average is as effective as face-to-face -face interventions. Individual online treatment was found to be more effective than group therapy, chat or email more effective than forums or webcam, and there were no significant differences found between synchronous and asynchronous forms of communication. Closed access websites require screening and personal authorization to enter the site were more effective than open sites anyone can use. Which again, highlights the importance of screening and assessment in a meta-analysis that examined randomized controlled trials of internet-based cognitive behavior therapy programs for depression and anxiety. Speck et al. 2006 found that treatment programs were largely effective. They suggested that the type of problem, symptoms of anxiety or depression, was less important than whether or not therapist support was available, example, monitoring, feedback or brief weekly phone calls. Dot. Promising Australian research also indicates that online interventions for depression may be effective. Two programs, Mood Gym and Blue Pages have been associated with improvements in mental health and knowledge and attitudes towards depression. Griffiths Christensen, 2007, Mackinnon, Griffiths Christensen, 2008. Mackinnon et al., 2008, found that benefits remained for both groups of participants allocated to Mood Gym and Blue Pages compared to the control group at a 12 month follow up. Interventions based on cognitive behavior therapy appear to be particularly suited to online delivery, as it is a structured treatment approach. Barak et al., 2008, Speck et al., 2006, dot, studies indicate that many clients and therapists hold positive views towards online therapy, Kavnag Shapiro, 2004, Skinner Latchford, 2006, and are willing to contemplate its use, Skinner Latchford, 2006, dot, the application of use of telecommunications to marriage and family counseling. Does exist. Heinz, 1994, Paul Locke, 2006, King et al., 1998, 
suggested that the asynchronous nature of email allows family members to read and respond at a time that is suitable to them and they can delay a response while they consider the contents of the communication the main challenges raised in the literature that are related to online family therapy or counseling center on the lack of nonverbal cues gilkey et al 2009 gensius sega 2001 and an inability to witness interactions paul lock 2006 the discouragement of impulsive hostile or negative comments without a cooling off period for example recognizes and draws attention to the permanency of email records king et al 1998 dot sim 2004 suggested that the loss of information in telecommunications in the case of online dispute resolution may have an impact on issues such as trust online dispute resolution however may be appropriate where interpersonal dynamics are destructive for example where conflict violence or abuse confinement or imprisonment are involved conley tyler mcpherson 2006 dot clients have breathing space in high emotional or distressing moments conley tyler mcpherson 2006 dot gilkey carey and wade 2009 found that computer literacy was not a consistent factor in reported comfort or ability to benefit from the video conferencing therapy program under study conferencing facilities have been used in family work within their clinical mental health practice louis and raphael 2007 noted that teleconferencing has been a useful and well received intervention to involve geographically separated family members in care plans gilkey et al 2009 reported on the use of video conferencing in family therapy for families of children with a traumatic brain injury video conferencing sessions were well received by participants with 90% rating the website accompanying the sessions and 88% rating the video conferencing itself as moderately to extremely helpful there are lingering questions regarding the right mix of online programs and face to face therapy how it is best delivered and under what circumstances people will benefit or not Kavanagh and Shapiro 2004 Griffiths et al 2007 McKinnon et al 2008 and how to effectively integrate online therapy with other models of care Kavanagh and Shapiro 2004 In the case of online dispute resolution these considerations are in their infancy Several studies suggest a need for training for staff that is specific to the use of information technology in therapy Gilkey et al 2009 Proudfoot 2004 Rochlin et al 2004 Santiviran 2009 Ibarra and Eaton 2005 Griffiths and Christensen 2007 reported a high level of use by rural users of Mood Gym a cognitive behavioral therapy internet intervention and blue pages a depression information website hand chung and peters 2009 recognized the positive potential of the internet if safety procedures are in place for women who are seeking help regarding domestic violence and feel ashamed or need to find ways that will not alert the perpetrator to their accessing help hand et al 2009 also pointed out the possible use of the internet as an anonymous and private way for perpetrators of violence to seek help marginalized people may be less likely to use online therapy for example refugees culturally and linguistically diverse people and those with no access to the internet hand et al 2009 in discussing online dispute resolution primerano 2004 drew attention to the fact that it may be particularly complicated for the culturally and linguistically diverse population as there may be written language literacy as well as computer literacy issues as would be expected people familiar with the online environment are more likely to use online counseling libet archer manson and york 2006 in a comparison of users of face to face therapy and internet support groups by skinner and latchford 2006 the users of internet support groups were more likely to think that computer based communication with a therapist would have a positive impact on their mental health abbot et al 
2008, reported that in early trials of Panic Online, an online treatment program, some participants lacked IT skills and hence had difficulties. Data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, ABS, 2006, appears to support this assertion, with 93% of 15 to 17 year olds and 85% of 18 to 24 year olds reporting internet use compared to 54% of 55 to 64 year olds and only 19% of those aged 65 years and over. Abbott et al., 2008, in their clinical and research work at Swinburne University of Technology e-therapy unit, found that therapeutic alliance was not compromised and in fact proposed that online therapy allows greater contact with the therapist than face-to-face, -face, increasing continuity of care. The absence of a face-to-face -face therapeutic relationship may be part of the attraction to online therapy for some individuals, for example, those with an avoidant personality, K. Halford, Personal Communication, 23 of July 2009. Gilkey et al., 2009, noted that the loss of nonverbal information can be offset by the increased comfort that participants felt due to being in their own homes. In the case of video conferencing, this comfort may also bring about family patterns of interaction that would not otherwise be seen. In the e-therapy unit at Swinburne, it is mandatory to have contact details of the client and their general practitioners, Abbott et al., 2008. Pollock, 2006, suggested counsellors have client contact information as well as an email address, the name of a counsellor in the geographical area in case of emergencies, and emergency contact details. Comparisons of costs associated with online and face-to-face -face therapy are not clear-cut. Costs may also be shifted, for example, a video conference can reduce travel costs for clients but increase overhead costs for the practitioner, SIM, 2004. Therapists potentially serve more clients on a daily basis, reducing overall costs and cutting waiting time due to the decreased demand on therapist time, Proudfoot, 2004. 4.6 Ethical Issues in Counseling Research In much of the discussion of ethical dimensions of applied disciplines such as medicine, education, and counseling, writers have tended to focus on the implications of a small set of basic ethical principles, Beauchamp and Childress, 1979, Kitchener, 1984. These are, beneficence, acting to enhance client well-being, non-maleficence, avoiding doing harm to clients, autonomy, respecting the right of the person to take responsibility for himself or herself, and fidelity, treating everyone in a fair and just manner, dot. There is a wide range of ethical issues associated with counseling research. Some of the more frequent dilemmas are John MacLeod. 2003. Studying experimental or innovative treatments that may cause harm to clients, excluding people from therapy unless they take part in a research study, compromising the confidentiality of the client counselor relationship by making recordings of sessions that may subsequently be heard by several members of a research team, research interviews or questionnaires triggering of painful material for clients, counsellors in research studies feeling self-conscious or anxious and as a result, not functioning at their best for clients, using archival information about clients, e.g. case records, without their consent, unconsciously manipulating therapy process or content to produce results that conform to a research hypothesis, the possibility of caution arising from asking a current client to take part in a research study conducted by their therapist, 4.6.1 informed consent. The most important strategy to deal with ethical dilemmas is to rely on the fact that participants have been fully informed about research procedures and the risks entailed and therefore take personal responsibility for any negative consequences of participation. In many research studies participants are required to read and sign a consent form, which would usually include the following, John MacLeod, 2003, dot, name, address and contact number of the person carrying out the study, if appropriate. The name of the research supervisor may be included, a description of the aims of the study, information about procedures, and what will be demanded of the participant, 
description of any potential risks to the participant, account of measures that will be taken to ensure confidentiality, information about what will be done with the data, statement about the right to withdraw from the study at any time, the name, address and contact number of the person or professional association to whom the research participant could make a complaint if necessary, information about the arrangements for debriefing at the end of the study, participants would routinely be given their own copy of this contract to keep. After it had been signed by both parties, 4.6 point to ensuring confidentiality. A basic necessity in all research is to disconnect information about client identity. It is important that research data is identified only by a neutral code number, with the key to the code, along with biographical information about research informants, stored in a secure place. Other techniques for safeguarding confidentiality include remembering to lock rooms that contain research data, checking that research assistants or technicians understand the importance of confidentiality, destroying notes and tapes after the completion of a study or offering to return tapes to informants. Omitting information from a report if it will compromise the identity of an informant, if the research participant can see that the researcher is doing everything possible to protect confidentiality, then he or she will be more willing to be open, honest and forthcoming in the information that he or she discloses. Many studies highlight confidentiality as a major issue related to online therapy, Chester, Glass, 2006, Hunt et al., 2005, Pollock, 2006, Santhi Viran, 2004, discussed issues such as validating the identity of clients, the possibility that anyone accessing a computer could access and print messages, and the fact that backup systems are logically inconsistent with the permanent deletion of communication from computers. Chester and Glass, 2006, However, pointed out that there is no situation that is risk-free in face-to-face -face therapy, filing cabinets may be left unlocked or walls may be thin. In fact, online communication has particular safeguards that can be used, for example, email interception security risks can be virtually eliminated by the use of encryption, Chester Glass, 2006, Santhiviran, 2004, dot, the International Society of Mental Health Online was established in the late 1990s to promote the use of online technologies among mental health professionals, Chester, Glass, 2006. Around this time, guidelines were also established regarding ethical online counseling, such as those created by the American Psychological Association. In 1997, American Counseling Association in 1999 and, in 2005, the British Association of Counseling and Psychotherapy. The Australian Psychological Society published similar guidelines in 2004, which are available for members only. 4.7 Summary Counseling a person is itself difficult and needs lots of training. Doing research in the area of counseling, Measuring and recording the behavior of the client is not an easy task. The researcher faces lots of ethical and confidentiality issues. Researcher maintains the objectivity of the study on one hand. On other hand, he has to deal with the client in a therapeutic alliance, not technically. Some practitioners may place high value on face-to-face. -face. Interpersonal communication, whereas others, particularly related to online dispute resolution, are anxious about witnessing displays of emotion and prefer the more structured online environment. Conley Tyler McPherson, 2006, Sim, 2004. Dot. Thank you. Subscribe to our channel for more updates and we will see you with the next chapter.